All right. So in Unix-like operating system, there's been a long history of text editors. The original one was called Ed. Ed allowed you to edit one single line in a text file. You wanted to edit the next line, you told it to go to the next line. You can never see more than one line at a time. Ed was awesome. Uh, no, it wasn't. Then they brought, they brought along X, which was Ed Extended. Um, it had visual mode, but you could still only ever edit one line at a time. So eventually somebody said, you know, it would be really good if we could actually edit multiple lines at once and if we could see the entire file and blah, 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 blah. So somebody came up with something called VI. VI stood for Visual and Interactive Editor. If anybody here has ever used VI other than, you know, the ones that are actually doing the hybrids, you'll know it's not very visual and it's not very interactive. It's interactive in the sense that you can type in complex commands and make things happen. Um, so VI originally was written in 1976. It's been around for a while. And VI itself is for Unix, not for Linux. It's for Unix. So somewhere along the way, somebody said, okay, well, we're going to clone it, make it open source. And they came up with a bunch of them. Uh, there was one called Elvis. It's dead. I wish it was a joke, but it's dead. Uh, NVI, one called Vile, and one called Vim. Uh, right now, the only one that's still around really is Vim. None of the others really had anything to offer. In this course, we use Vim. Why? Because, well, that's what we're going to use. Now, most Linuxes ship something called VI, but it's actually not VI. It's Vim without the, all the extra meat that makes it good. It's basically VI from 1976 with no extra nice things. No, no syntax coloring, no automatic brackets, you know, barely functionality. Um, so that happened. Vim came out. They added all this extra functionality. It was, first came out in 1991. If you type in VI at the command line, it actually launches Vim. Congratulations, it's the same thing. Um, it's pretty much in everything. And they actually make one called GVim. So if you really enjoy Vim, you can install it on Windows and have the Vim experience under Windows. And for those that are really used to using VI-like editors, they make key bindings for pretty much every major IDE. So if you use Visual Studio, you can install a Vim plugin. So you can use VI keystrokes. If you're using any of the IntelliJ, that's actually a plugin they offer to install as soon as you install it. Um, most of the other ones, uh, Visual Studio Code's got it. They all have VI functionality. Um, why? Because it's really good once you actually know how to use the darn thing. Um, now, Vim is a powerful quick text editor. It is surprisingly powerful compared to... People say, oh, yeah, but I use, like, you know... Eclipse. Uh, okay. Eclipse is an IDE. It's not a good text editor. It's barely a good uh, functional IDE to start with, so it's never going to be a great text editor. For example, I attend on Windows, I tend to use something called Notepad. Several people in here will have it installed. It's probably the best pure Windows text editor you can get. It's so good they actually ported something equivalent to Linux. It went the other way for a change. Now, I had this one file. It was really, 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 really big. It was a four gigabyte text file. And I needed to do some search and replace in it. Um, doing it in Notepad++, a single search and replace could take up to 45 minutes. CPU was sitting 100%, blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, that's great, done. I reload the file in GVim, the search and replace took 10 minutes. Mind you, it also maxed out every core in my machine, but hey, it did it fast. It's very good for programming because it has the ability to detect what language you're using automatically within reason, just like Notepad++ and most good text, Sublime's another good one. It is not a formatting tool, it only does plain text, and it only does Unix line endings because that's where it came from. 
There's ne nearly limitless options and commands. There's so many commands in it that most people will only use maybe 5% of what's inside VI. And they'll be able to do their jobs just fine with it. It has a built-in tutorial tool called VimTutor. When you launch VimTutor, which as some of you may have done already for the hybrids, you'll see that VimTutor launches in VI. It is actually in a text editor. And you're taking the tutorial in the text editor that you're learning about. It's a really cute trick. So Vim is launched by typing in the Vim command. There's a bunch of options and a file name. The file name is optional. It's just like when you launch Notepad. You can launch Notepad and you don't have a document loaded. You can choose to create a document and save it. Or you can like, you know, double click on a text file and it launches your text editor of choice. By default, normally it's Notepad under Windows. Under Linux, it might be gedit, just for, you know, whichever one they happen to be using. Um, by, so by default, it opens up an empty screen. Um, there's many options available. If I go, you can see all the arguments that it offers. You can even put it in good old EX mode if you want to go back into the dark ages. Um, there's batch modes, binary mode. Lisp mode for those that want to suffer. Um, there's a bunch of other things. It also supports right to left for those languages. A lot of cute tricks. So when we launch Vim, you get a screen that looks like this. In actual fact, it used to look like this. Now it looks like this. You get a little welcome thing in the middle that gives you a few basic things you could do at this point. Do you, anybody want to take a guess why they added this screen? Anybody? Yes? Not far from that. If you notice, one of the very first commands they show you is this. Used to be people would launch into VI and not know how to get out of it. And they're like, oh no. And they try the good old control C, that doesn't work. But now they've gone clever, you go control C and it, gets, it now shows you, if you haven't done anything yet, it shows, hey, this is how you exit. They've made VI user friendly. Let's just, let me tell you, when I learned VI or Vim back in the day, it was not user friendly. Uh, you didn't have all these little hints that, hey, you suck and you haven't read how to use this yet. Um, oops. So the things you have in here are the cursor. So if I go back into VI here, so let me go um, there. We're going to go with an empty file just so it looks as close to what you've got on the screen. You've got yourself a cursor. See the tilde is down the side? By the way, for those of you that don't know what that character is called, it's called tilde. It's a very important character. Computers really like tilde because most people never use it, so it's a good delimiter. And down here is, <coughs> excuse me, the name of the current buffer. In other words, which file are you currently editing? The way VI works is everything's treated as a buffer. A buffer is an allocated piece of memory where there is content. In this case, it's a buffer that contains text. So over here, you've got the current line and the current column. So it tells you where you are inside the text file. Surprisingly handy if you're editing code. So here's how v VI works, or Vim works. It takes the contents of the file you want to edit and copies it into memory. That memory is known as a work buffer. Any changes you make are to the buffer, not to the file. So for example, in Windows, you open up a text file, you make a bunch of changes. If you haven't hit save, where are those changes right now? 
in memory. They're contained in memory. Same thing with VI. When you're done, you actually have to write the changes back out. So, once again, this is what we've got. I don't remember what the all stands for, and apparently the slides don't talk about it either, so it's not all that important. Vim has three modes. Command, input, and last line. So when you start Vim, you are in command mode. If you are in any other mode, you hit escape, it brings you back to command mode. So what is command mode? Command mode means, i got to be careful here, so I don't, of course, I'm hitting letters that actually switch me out of command mode. But in theory, if I were to type, right now I'm typing numbers and nothing's going in because it's waiting for a command. The command modes, you can use it for text manipulation commands, also known as insert, append, uh, replace, search and replace, that kind of stuff. Um, you can change modes from append to overwrite kind of stuff. You can save and exit. And most commands are alpha characters, <coughs> not control sequences. And the commands are case sensitive because this is Linux after all. And everything is case sensitive in Linux. So, insert mode means you are now currently allowing you to, to edit the text on the screen. And it's there's a bunch of different insert co mode commands. There's insert, append, open, replace, and change. Basically, that is you are editing a file. Amazing. And you can also go to last line mode, which is when you are entering commands at the bottom. As you can see, I just hit the colon, and suddenly my cursor jumped to the bottom, and now I can actually type commands. So, those are the basic things that exist. So, for input mode, you have several different modes. You have insert, but notice they give you two different ways of doing inserts. Insert before the cursor, insert before the first non-blank character on the line. Um, I should have grabbed a piece of PHP for this, actually, because you guys all enjoy PHP. Oh, look, now we've got colors. Okay. So, right now, this, I'm editing a file. Actually, this is a really, really big file. As you can see, I'm sitting at 17% right now of scrolling. There is a, a lot of code in here. However, let me show you what the different modes are. If I go just straight I, lowercase i, it means I can start typing wherever I happen to be. However, if I were to go capital I, it jumps you to the start of the first character in the line. It's great when you're editing code that's indented. That way, you don't screw up your indentation. Um, as you probably learned by now, PHP doesn't care about indents, no more than Java does. But people reviewing your code is going to care a hell of a lot about your indents. Why? Because it makes it readable. So capital I will jump to the first character in the line. And the one I'm after is not that window, it's this window. Now, A stands for append, so if I goes for insert, A goes for append. Lowercase a goes after the cursor, capital A goes at the end of the line. So if I'm sitting after the use word here, so you can see my cursor, for those of you that are following along. If I go A, it allows me to start typing right after. On the other hand, let's just say you realize you had a bug in your code and you forgot a semicolon. Because, you know, we all love missing our semicolons. If you do a shift A, it jumps to the end of the line so you can add your character there. 
O is to open a line. So let's say you want a new blank line. You can choose to either open above or below where you're at. So if I go lowercase o, it creates a line below. Uppercase o opens a line above. It's not particularly complex. Let's just remember what all these stupid commands do. And then R replaces the current character. So let's just say you realized over here that you had a bug. Actually, me. At one point, you instead of typing in semicolon, you typed in a full colon because, well, you know, you had a moment. I'm sure nobody in here has done that at all in their Java core and Java programming at all ever. A single R allows you to replace a single character, so you can theoretically only replace one, and it doesn't damage the rest of the line, so that you don't accidentally start overwriting everything. On the other hand, if I go capital R and I go Right. Oops, I forgot my semicolon. Right. So, capital R just starts replacing. Until you hit the escape key, it'll just, it's as if you're in a normal text editor. You can go back and forth, up and down the buffer, delete whatever you want. So, those are the, how you get to edit your text. Now, in command mode, there's a few other essentials. You can move the cursors, the cursor, without using arrow keys. Now, some of you might be wondering, why the heck would you not want to use the arrow keys to move your cursor? Has anybody in here, does anybody here remember the old green screen dumb terminals you used to see in stores? The old VT100 dumb terminals? The dumb terminals that didn't have arrow keys? Yes, there once was a time where you, for example, IKEA had these until... You know how IKEA now, they got that little circle of computers. You can go in there and you type in what you want to find and it tells you where it is. As recently as five years ago, they didn't have those nice little computers. They had dumb terminals where you and I could walk up and start typing into the dumb terminal. They had a slightly more modern dumb terminal that had arrow keys. <coughs> but way back in the day, some of those dumb terminals didn't have arrow keys. So somebody said, you know what, we really need to be able to move our cursor around. So we'll do HJKL. Not WASD, because, you know, WASD wasn't a thing back then. And the funny thing is, is HJKL is all on one line. So it feels a little weird, because for most people, are used to reaching up and down to move up and down. You'd end up having to move, you know, with all the keys in one row. However, when you got used to it, it was really, really fast. Because your fingers moved even less, because you could theoretically program each of your fingers for a direction. X allows you to delete a single character. DW deletes a single word. DD deletes a line. And if you're really desperate and you can't remember how to quit, you can go Shift ZZ. And it'll write and quit. It's the shortcut to save and quit. Now, there is some specialness when it comes to like DD. And I'll show you guys in a second. So, for example, earlier you saw me do an X, even though you didn't know what letter I typed in. X allows me to replace, that was weird, what the heck was that? So, X allows you to nuke a single character, oop, it's gone. Um, there was also DW, which lets you delete a word. So if you just want to get rid of the whole word, that works. Um, DD lets you delete a whole, shoot. DD deletes an entire line. That's cool. However, DD has another piece of functionality that's not listed here. Let's say I want to get rid of all these use statements. So for those of you that aren't used to object-oriented PHP, this is the same thing as an include. So, you know. If I go D5D, I deleted five lines. Ah. D100D, I just nuked 100 lines of code. Pretty nifty. It's a great way to get rid of a bunch of lines real fast. And I'm not going to do ZZ yet, but ZZ is right and quit. Now, <laughs> how many of you have learned about regex yet? Regular expressions? Anyone? Going once, going twice, yay. Okay. 
I am going to do the fastest regex introduction you've ever seen because you could teach an entire course on regex. I, I'm kidding you not. You could actually spend like four lectures just on regex. Regex stands for regular expression. It's pattern matching on steroids. Now, how many of you remember the like statement in SQL? How many of you enjoyed the like statement in SQL? How many of you actually remember how to use it now? <laughs> so the like statement is like a pattern matching on like, you know, 101, the baby edition. It doesn't let it do a whole lot. When you do regex, it allows you to pattern match complex patterns. And you do a search by hitting the slash key. That's telling you that you're going to search mode. And I want to search, for example, let's say I just want to find a word. So I want to find the word method. And holy crap, I can't, what the hell? Okay, I want to search for method. There, it jumped me to method. So now I can jump through here. And you can see it, you know, it's following. And I'm hitting N for the next match. And that was definitely the wrong command. What I just did is I did a paste. Um, but that is how you find the next one. But let's just say I wanted to find anything that had P something R. I could go P dot, what the hell? P dot R. P says match a single character. So I'll match that one. Oh, there's properties. P something R. Again. And, you know, if I keep doing that, it's going to go on forever. So, what the heck just happened there? Ooh, that was scary. So, the dot is a single character. A... Asterisk says match any number of times. It doesn't say match any character. It says match any number of times. So if I were to do P dot star R, it would match anything that starts with a P, has any number of letters until it hits R. So, for example, templates controller. There's the P. There's your R. So that's cute. However, there's another couple that are really handy. Let's say I want to find any line that ends in Y. I can say I want to search for Y at the end of a line. Dollar sign means end. I'm just doing a quick series of commands here. I don't even know if these are even in the slides. However, you can go look up online how to use regex properly. But let's just demonstrate that you can do some pretty Powerful searching. Actually, this is funny because it's pretty much matching two words. So it's finding array, display, and library twice. Or I could choose also to say I want to find the word class at the beginning of the line. And the class only shows up in one place because this whole file is a single class. So that, those are some of the patterns you can do. You can do ranges. So you can say anything from 0 to 9. So if you're looking for numbers, that's a good way to do it. Um, if you're looking for specific strings and you want it to be near another string, you can tell it to do that. Uh, it's kind of crazy what you can do with the regex. And you can also do a question mark, which does a reverse order regex. So if you start at the bottom of the document, it'll search backwards. So n goes to the last, to the next search. So if I did this search, I can go next, 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 which is already working. Capital N goes the other way. And ng jumps to a line n. So if I go n10, it jumped me to line So it'll match, and it'll jump you to the next match number, which is kind of cool. So, some more last line commands. W to write the file. 
Very important. Same thing as S. Control S in Windows. Now, I guarantee everybody in here is going to screw up in the following manner. Except maybe the Linux guys. The couple of guys that are running Linux in here. Most of you are going to go and do a Control S while you're in VI. Congratulations. You're stuck. There's a way out of it, and I can I always have to look it up. Do you guys remember what the way to get out of Control S is? There's a way to do it, and I just don't remember. What You've never... <laughs> You've never done it. I don't remember. There's a they basically control S puts you in some weird. Oh, cool. They've disabled it. I can't do it anymore. Congrats, guys. You don't have to worry about control S. That used to be a freaking pain in the ass um, in older versions of uh, Linux and Unix. Control S would put you in this weird uh, macro command mode. And then there was this other weird combination of keystrokes you had to do to get out of it. It was terrible. So hey, ignore what I just said. You don't have to worry about Control S. Uh, Q to quit. W exclamation mark will allow you to write a read-only file. Please note, if you do not have permissions to write said file, it still won't let you write said file. But if you have permissions to write the file, but it's in read-only mode, you will at least be able to overwrite it. Q exclamation mark means quit without saving. So if you do a quit after making changes, oh, damn it, there's control S. And I got out of it and I don't know how. So control Q will quit. As you'll see, I tried to quit after I made some changes to my file, even though actually I put everything back the way it was when I first created it. It's saying, hey, there's no changes. So essentially, the exclamation mark means force. Make this happen. Make it obey against its will. So if I go quit, it just quits, regardless of the changes I did. Um, you can also choose to, let's say I make a change. So I'm going to go put in, uh, if I go, colon WQ, guess what will happen? It'll write, then quit. Just like that. And just show you that the thing is there. There's my Put it back the way it was. And I just changed it. Uh, you can also hit E, which it completely ignored me. E means start a new file as an open a file for editing. Not O to open, because O is already assigned to something. E to edit a file. There's a few other things you can do, which is kind of cool. If I go back into here, if I go back to my file here, I can go colon sh. Now, looks like I'm back at the command prompt, right? And I can do stuff here. I can, you know, look around, do some stuff. I type in exit, I'm back in my text editor. So you drop the command line temporarily without losing your changes. So let's say you're writing some code and you don't remember what that other file is called. You could theoretically go sh, jump to the command line, go find that file you're referring to, exit back out, and then, you know, make stuff happen. Um, if I were to go... Actually, let me go quit and go. I can also run a command right from the command line. So it'll run the command, show it to you, quits. It's fun. However, if I choose to, I can go colon dot. So this is shows I'm just doing command line. <coughs> Like this one right here, like I'm, I'm circling my cursor around. If you do com dot exclamation mark command, it'll actually put it in your buffer. So if I did dot exclamation mark ls dash l, oops, that's not a command. Ah, look, command not found. It's in my buffer. Let's try that again. Insert dot, oh, come on.
There, I did the ls command, now I put it in my buffer. I can now edit the output of my ls command. It's handy. Not that useful, but it's handy. There's times when you need to do things like this, especially when you're trying to get a list of files. And there's a few other things you can do. Double exclamation mark from command mode. Now, <coughs> there's a few buffers when you work with Vim. There's the work buffer, also known as this. Then, the, in other words, it's where your normal file is contained. The general purpose buffer, think of it as the clipboard in Windows. It basically will store whatever you copy, so you can paste it. It remembers the last thing you put into it, just like the Windows key, uh, short, um, clipboard. Unless, of course, you're somebody who's discovered the joy of Windows V in Windows. For those of you that are curious, try it when you're not in class. You'll have fun. And then you have name buffers and numbered buffers. In other words, you can actually take content, copy it to multiple spots in memory, so you can keep multiple pieces of clipboard active at any given time. So the general purpose buffer I already explained. Um, it also, so the undo information is stored in here also. So by the way, I haven't showed you guys how to undo. Anybody want to take a guess what the keystroke for undo is? I heard someone say it. You, I want to undo. And when you get far back enough, it'll go, you're already at the oldest change. Congratulations. So the general purpose buffer keeps track of the undo information and you can copy text to the buffer and put it somewhere else. As you notice, there's words in brackets, yank and put. That's hinting to what the commands are to copy and paste. Because I can guarantee control C is not gonna copy Control-C, well, tries to quit. Named buffers, and same thing with numbered buffers, they serve roughly the same job. They serve the same job as general purpose buffer, except it doesn't have the undo. It only contains text you put there. So you have 26 buffers. So in other words, you have 26 different clipboards you can contain your text in. So. For example, let's just say there's a standard template you're supposed to use for your comments, top of a file. In theory, you could use a named buffer for that. If you had, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you had certain functions you use all the time or certain chunks of code you use all the time, you could actually yank it into one of those buffers and get back to it. And there are ways of getting VI to preload some of your buffers. Numbered buffers are numbered one to nine. They're read only. They contain anything that's been deleted recently greater than one line long. So if I've got a long chunk, so if I go, let's go back over here, and I go D5D, D10D, and D25D. So I deleted 5, 10, and 25 lines. If I were to go, oh heck, what's the hex the command? That's wrong, that's just the last one I did. I'll do the numbered ones, I'll show you guys in a second. So to copy lines of text, it's YY. Yank it. So no earlier I said DD to delete one line, D, 10, D deletes 10 line. Y, Y either copies one line. If you do Y, 10, Y, it copies 10 lines. Or you can go Shift, Y, it yanks a single line. Or you can also choose a number and number of lines. So if I wanted to yank files to a general purpose buffer, I could go C5Y. So not obvious. Oh, what the heck just happened?
So if I go C5Y, looks like nothing happened, right? But if I were to go P to, oh, come on. C5Y, it's lying. That's cute. God, I hate it when the slides are wrong. And I've used these before. Hold on. Oh, you know, you have to be really odd. Do you notice what I wasn't typing in? The damn quote mark. Allow me to stop looking like a tool. If I go quote C5Y, now I hope this actually worked. Now it worked, it copied the first five lines. Actually, I wasn't a, that was a pretty terrible copy, hang on. Quote C5Y. I go P to put, oh, come on, quote, C, 5, Y. There you go. You know you did it right when it tells you at the bottom you did it right. And I hit P for put, and there's my five lines I yanked. Holy cow. That was rough. So P puts below the current line. Capital P puts above the current line, just like the O and the A. And if I want to use a named buffer, I could actually yank that to a named buffer. So since I named the buffer C in this example, so in buffer C, put in five lines and yank it. If I want to get from there, I go quote mark 5P. And that's something I grabbed from somewhere else earlier, apparently. If I do this, C5P, <laughs> I've yanked it a few times. So there it is. Uh, the other, what I just did was something stupid. I told it to paste it five times. So if I just do quote CP, it just grabs for whatever was in C. On the other hand, if I go quote C5P, it's telling it to paste five times. It's great if you're trying to make lots of lines really fast. You know when you're trying to like set up sample data off an SQL database and you wrote your first insert statement? You can do magic like that and do, and then I'll suddenly have 100 insert statements just because you can. They'll all be the same, but at least you could get 100 done. Okay, that is the biggest parts of VI. It actually has tons of other stuff. Um, it actually has a, a preview mode, depending which functionality you turn on, you can actually have it have, um, make it do code completion, bracket completion, all that jazz, it's just settings in a file. And, you can actually do search and replace. Actually, I'm surprised the slides didn't talk about search and replace. Um, but what you can do for a search and replace is, for a search, you start with your slash. And you're going to look for, and it's ignoring me again. Oh, come on. Just go show it. I haven't used this in a long time. So I want to find app. I want to place it with capital case app. And now it found the very first one and replaces the first one. 
So you can see down here that the command is S for substitute. This is what you're searching for. This is what you want to replace it with. However, you can choose to make a command global. And it's not cooperating. I think they've changed the default behavior search. And it's ignoring me. It's finding the app, but it's not doing the replace. I'll go double check that command and I'll show you guys later. It'll be easier that way than me just keep typing in commands at random. Now this makes me feel stupid because I used VI as my primary editor as a job for like over a year. But it's been so long since I've done it. And the, I guarantee that command I was just typing in, the, the colon slash something slash s slash slash thing used to work. So that's changed since what it used to be. So VI, Vim has changed some of the default commands for from VI. That's not cool. It's life. But mind you, that was also 24 years ago. So, you know, things have changed a little bit in 24 years. Uh, I still use VI all the time, but I don't use any of the fancy functionality. I use it to configure web servers. You don't need anything fancy for that. Um, actually, brace expansion I already covered. Skip, skip, grip I covered. Ah, quote marks, there we go. Ah, right, damn, I just skipped three slides. Understanding the use of quotings. Now, the shell, and once again, we're using bash. The quotes tell it to tell the difference between a literal string and whether or not the string is being used as a character or as a meta character. And you guys have probably experienced the joy of uh, escaping quote marks in a string in Java. Yes, I hope. Um, now, in your web development class, you know, your PHP class that you're all so enjoying right now? Has your instructor, <laughs> has your instructor covered the difference between single quotes and double quotes? Yeah, oh yeah, I said that your teacher covered it. I didn't say that he put it in the slides. Explain the difference between a literal string and a string that can be expanded. Okay. In on the command line, we have escape. We have little characters or literal strings and then strings that allow you to do variable expansion. And the single quote and the double quote triggers the difference in the behavior. Now, the backslash character is used to preserve a literal meaning of a character that follows it. So I really don't need to explain escaping to you guys, I hope because you guys should have learned it in your Java class, and you probably have to do it in your PHP class too, because, you know, that's programming. Um, however, it's not recommended that you use meta characters as characters in a file name, because you sometimes you introduce some really strange behavior. Let me drop back to my command line here. See? I got a file called this quote question marks, right? So if I were to go, you'll notice that I hit tab to autocomplete. And what it did is they threw in a backslash in front of the quote mark because quotes are meta characters. But it also threw in something else at the end here because I have no idea what those are. This is actually the bash shell telling me it has no idea what these characters are. There's something wrong here. It's kind of cool. So, and I can't get at it. That's why you don't use meta characters because bad things happen. You get to the point where you can actually remove things because they get stuck. Now, a single quote is just protect protect all the characters within the single quote. 
So just like in PHP, when you use a single quote, it will not expand the variables. So if you go echo single quote dollar sign Bob, it's going to output dollar sign Bob, not the variable Bob. However, the quote mark cannot protect itself. So, in other words, a single quote protects all the characters within it, but it cannot protect itself. You have to escape it if you want to protect it. It's different from the backslash because it protects the whole string. Um, so, for example, I'll do this example where somebody's talking. So, if I go echo, Dan says, hi. It echoes Dan says hi. It didn't bark about the quote mark. It didn't bark about the exclamation mark. So I can put in all the characters I want in there and it doesn't care. It treats it as a literal string. They're protected. That means the string is the string as it is. End of story. The double quote protects all symbols and characters except for two. It doesn't protect the dollar sign, it doesn't protect, actually three, the single quote, and it doesn't protect the backslash. Now, some of you might be wondering why. If I go It'll do, I'll go fishing. That's the only way you can actually do a single quote in a string. Congratulations, you got to screw with the quote, the, you know, the quote marks. But on the other hand, um, let me just go find something here I can use. That one. If I were to go echo, You'll see that it is not outputting SSH connection dollar sign. It's actually outputting the value of the environment variable. I have an environment variable here called SSH connection. Its value is that. In other words, it's saying that 192.168.193.1, this port is connected to this machine on port 22, and it's outputting that. So if I actually wanted to just Output without the extra stuff, I could actually go echo SSH connection, and there's the contents of the variable. Just like in PHP, it'll take the variable and expand it. In bash, on a, in a bash script, and or a bash command prompt, var environment variables are preceded by a dollar sign, and you can echo them. This should look familiar to people that program with PHP because guess where PHP got the idea? <laughs> I'm just saying. You know, the guy who wrote PHP way back in the day said that's not broken. We're just going to keep reusing it. Yeah, it was broken. But you were still using it 20 years later. Go figure. Now, here's the most, one of the cutest tricks you can do with Linux. You want to save the output from a program, but you don't want to save the error messages to the same thing. So let's say you're going to run a command, but you want it to be completely silent. So most of the time, you know, you run a command, it tells there's output that comes out. If there's an error, or something's gone wrong, it comes out too. So if I were to go it'll go ls can't access because there's no such file or directory. That is an error message. That is not what comes out of standard out. It's what comes out of standard error. Do you guys have this TDIO in Java? No, that's a C++ thing. And a C thing. It could just say it goes to how much I know about Java, right? So, once you learn how to program in C, if ever you go there, you will learn about standard I.O. And 
basically standard I.O. is standard input output. And it has a few different things. It has a few channels. With any <coughs> command you write, write on Linux, it has standard out, which is, if it succeeds, that's standard out. If there's something horribly wrong, goes to standard error. So if I were to go, let me just go ls for starters. If I go ls e star and for ta -ta -ta -ta, it'll show that right here, can't find that. And it outputted the e for the example. If I were to go one to good dot text, notice now I'm only getting, I'll make this a little bit bigger. All I'm getting is the error message now. But if I were to go, there's my output from my command that was good. Now if I go to output to, now I get nothing going to come out, put to the command, but if I go cat good.txt, again, example is there. If I go cat oops.txt, there's my error message. So I can run commands and not actually ever have errors come up to the screen. I can send all the errors to a file. Now, some people are wondering, well, what's the use of that? Because usually, you know, I've got people that ask me that question. The reason you want to do that is, let's say you're writing a very complex script. And when you guys start doing bash scripts in a couple of weeks, you're going to want to start outputting your errors. The, let's say you have an automated job that runs every night. and how many people here know about version control? Okay, you really need to learn that before you go for a job interview. Just putting it out there. Um, there's nothing worse than going for a job interview as a developer and you don't know what version control is. Um, version control is a way to keep your source code versioned. In other words, you write code, you commit your changes, you realize you made a mistake, you can revert to an older version. Or I'm writing code, he's writing code, and he's and she's writing code, we all commit our changes, they get committed in order, and we realize that he screwed up. We can go see who screwed up. Or we both commit at the same time, there's a conflict, there's conflict management, that's version control. Now, that is version control. Now, a very common thing now that's happening in the industry is something called continuous integration. There's another magic keyword that's good to know about. Continuous integration means every single time code gets committed to the re code repository, a job launches to automatically build the code and run tests against it. So at the end of the day, you got a developer, he commits 500 lines of code. Dude was sloppy, he didn't really check his code. Midnight, the code gets updated on the build, on the build server, build server tries to do a build, it shits the bed. Because dude missed a semicolon. Take it as someone who's actually done that, leaving on Friday early and, you know, you forget, you go commit your changes and you forget your last semicolon and it breaks the build. That was like my second job out of college. It was not a good time. We didn't have like, we didn't have like VPN back then. I had to drive like 45 minutes to go back to work on Saturday morning after drinking all night. <laughs> so, you know, it was a really, for, for me to go do a fix, it took 30 seconds. But anyways, I learned an important lesson that day. Um, so what this the two out would do is any good output would go to one file. All the errors that happen to go to another file. So that instead of having to look through a file that might have a thousand lines of text in it, and you discover that the build failed, you can just go look at the standard out, the error out for that night and see what the last set of errors were. Um, have you guys ever, you know when you write code in Java and you make a mistake and it just seems to give you like a million errors? And you wonder why? Well, don't you wish you could take all those, right now when you do it in Eclipse, it puts all those errors in a buffer, right? So at least you can scroll through that. Now, try running your Java app code right from the command line without Eclipse in front of you and try to capture all those error messages. How would you know what actually went wrong without having all the error messages? If you were to take that output and redirect it to a file, you could then peruse the file to your heart's content. And then if you really don't know what the heck's wrong, then you can take that file, copy it, and send it to a colleague to look at it. 
There's advantages to this. So that's one and two. You have a few options. You can choose to output everything to the same file. That's the opposite, where everything goes in one place. So the two shortcuts are the same. There's ampersand greater than or greater than ampersand. It does pretty much the same job. So if I go my script greater than ampersand out file, it'll take both commands and set it to the same place. Let me go and display and show you guys that. If I go no output, but if I go cat, you'll see there's the entire contents of the command I just ran. Both good and bad. These two are actually somewhat newer. This last one is the classic way of doing it. This has been working back in the day when I was at my, like my second job where I forgot my semicolon. We were working in VI on a Unix machine. And this was how we output error messages. So my script output out file, take number two, send it to the first argument. So that's what that's doing. So those three are doing the exact same thing. And then there's dev null. Let's say you don't care. So you want to be a complete Karen and not care about what happens. You just want to have your way. God, I hope there's no Karens in the room. I hate it when I do that and there's a Karen in the room because they get offended. Um, but let's say you want to run a script and you really don't care about the output of your script. Because maybe it's okay if it has errors. Maybe it'll generate, generate an error if it doesn't find what it's trying to do. But if it doesn't find it, that's okay because its job is to actually clean out that out anyways. So who cares, right? Let's say at night it's supposed to clear out a bunch of caches. And for some unknown reason, there's no cache files that were generated. It may give you an error saying the files you're trying to delete don't exist. That's okay. You don't care because they don't exist. So they invented something called dev null. So you can run a command and send everything to dev null. And it literally goes to nowhere. It turns it into a null value. You could take 10 gigs of output, redirect it to dev null, and it becomes a null amount of output. As in, the output never existed in the first place. It's cool. It's basically a black hole. Things go in, they can never come back out. <clears throat> now, so that's redirecting your output. There's also the find command. It allows you to search for files. Congratulations. There's ways of finding things. And believe it or not, find on Linux is way better than trying to find files under Windows. Because I'm sure you've all had the experience of you pull up the search tools in Windows, and you type some stuff in, and it doesn't find it, even though you know it's there. <coughs> so you write a program to do it, or you load up Node and load up Notepad plus plus, and you go find file with contents, and it searches through the file system for you. Get it using a stupid program to search, because Windows Search can't search worth a crap, never could. <coughs> so find path expression. So if you don't give it a path. <coughs> It uses the current directory. The expression has options, tests, and actions. It's a bunch of Boolean expressions. So for an example, here's one. Argument m time. M time stands for modified time. So files were modified after a certain amount of time. So if I go plus 90, it's saying files were modified in the last 90 days. So in this case, if I go find dash m time, and I just say one, I want to know what files have been modified in the last day. And found nothing. Duh. That's cool. Why does it think that's been modified in the last day? Oh, yeah. Duh. So anything older than one day.
There you go. If I go m time 1 means, hmm? there you go. Minus 1 means today. Slide says neither a plus nor a minus mean exactly 90 days. So apparently saying that it's modified, if I say modified 1, it's whatever was modified 24 hours ago. Minus 1 means modified since 24 hours. <coughs> so these are the files I created today. You'll notice some weird ones in here. Bash history. Well, that's the history of all the commands I've been running. Don't pay attention to X authority. That's just because my my thing is set up to forward X windows. <coughs> uh, Vim info, some other stuff. But these are the files that have been modified recently. You can search for file sizes. So you want to find in the local directory anything that is more than 10K. So if I go find dot dash size 10K, you'll see in here that I've got files in my current directory, including subdirectories, that are greater than 10K. There's that PHP file that I created earlier. And this is when I dumped out the entire OS tree, and this is when I copied some files during lecture two. And my bash history is bigger than 10K. You can search by name. Search anywhere from root, that's just what this is saying, anywhere from the root, any file that ends in .mp3. So when you're using the find command, it doesn't use regex, just so you know. This is, regex means, you know, wildcard, anything, just like DOS. Anything that's an MP3. Or you can do find type dash D, which is cool. You can go find dash type D, and it shows you only the directory. So if you want to know the directory structure, dash D will give it to you. Um, you can find specific files that are owned by a specific user. So if I want to know all the files that are owned by Bob, I could go like such. And it's saying Bob is not the name of a known user because I don't have a Bob user. So when you look at this example here where two goes to dev null, it wouldn't even tell me I don't know about Bob. It just says I didn't find anything owned by Bob. So if I go to... And it really cares about the spaces. Right now it's saying find anything that's owned by Bob. If Bob doesn't exist, it doesn't care because it's not important. If Bob doesn't exist, there won't be files owned by Bob, will there? So you can actually combine a bunch of these different arguments together. So if I wanted to find this, and then I also want to go m time dash my minus 1. So I want to find all files that are bigger than 10k but that were modified in the last day. Now you'll see I'm down to two files. It's a really, it's a really, really powerful tool. Surprisingly powerful. And the combination, that there's a bunch of other arguments you can do with it too. Um... So there's the following links, and there we go. You can actually figure out, feed it some regex. There is insane amounts of arguments you can feed it, as you can see. I can scroll and scroll and scroll, and these are all things you can feed to find. And I'm still talking, and it's still scrolling. Um, Find is really, really powerful. So remember earlier I did dash type and I showed you D for directory? Well, you're going to look for block devices, characters, directories, name pipes, regular files, symbolic links. You want to know where the symbolic links are? It'll tell you what the symbolic links are. Um, S for socket or D if you're running on Solaris because you're looking for a door. Solaris has things called doors. Um and you can search for user users, user IDs, 
bunch of other stuff. You can feed it other arguments, which is cool. You can feed it the, the delete argument. So I want to find files. And this is one that happens. If you've got a system that generates a lot of temporary files, and after a while, it gets to be too much. Believe it or not, those temporary files will build up. For example, we have a machine at work that generates uh, encrypted license files. As a rule of thumb, we don't delete the encrypted license files that get generated after they're generated in case something goes wrong so we can go back and see what went wrong. Um, however, about once a month, we have to clean it out. So what we have is we have a script that runs nightly that looks for any files that were created with a time frame of more than 30 days, bigger than a certain size, and then it just deletes them without having to run an RM command. It actually literally goes through and deletes any matches. It's fantastic. And there's other things you can combine with it, but that's actually one of the more powerful tools you've got. Now, that's the end of that. I'm going to hit the stop button.